Hello everyone and thank you all for coming uh, on what we were hoping was going to be a balmy spring day um, but in fact uh, we're heading for big frost which is a little bit dodgy for English winemakers and also um, elsewhere too which is unfortunate but it gives me huge pleasure to welcome Tamara and Simon uh, from Ridgeview. For people who don't know about English sparkling wine, Ridgeview has been very important in the whole story. It's been making, uh, well it was founded 27 years ago, it's been making very fine sparkling wines throughout that period and its founder Mike uh, Roberts with his wife Chris, they established something very special. Apart from making super wine, they've established a business which has been open and welcoming and helpful to other English winemakers and the whole industry owes a huge debt to them and that's being carried on by their children. Uh, Tamara who's now the CEO and Simon who's the head winemaker and they both play important roles in wine GB in general. Um, Tamara's on the board, Simon heads the technical winemaking committee and is also on the sustainability committee. Um, so they know the whole story, not only of their own business, but of English sparkling wine. So let's let them tell it. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. Thank you very much for having us. I'm just going to share our screen. We have a presentation. Um, there we go. Hopefully everyone can see. Thumbs up from anyone. It would be great. Lovely. Great. Thank you. So we will move on swiftly. <clears throat> Uh, she says, hopefully, technical hitch. Why is this not working? There we go. So we thought we'd just um, a little bit of background about um, the English wine industry. Obviously, it's um, changed a great deal over the last 27 years since we came onto the market. Um, as of now, there's over 658 commercial vineyards um, and now 164 wineries. Um, ranging from all sizes, so from people producing 10 to 20,000 bottles all the way up to um, just over a million bottles. So, I mean, it's changed a great deal. Sparkling wine is still um, still the main, the main production of English wine. Obviously, still wines are being made, um, but I think as an industry, it's really our sparkling wine that seems, certainly on an international scale, seem to be our most popular. And that's something that we um, that we specialize in. So we only make sparkling wine. Um, but so as of uh, 2019, there's now 3 million vines planted. Um, so that's producing 40 million bottles. No, that's not right. I'm predicted to reach, sorry, lifting off the screen. Yeah, I think one of the things, and, and Stephen Skelton sitting on the pat, uh, in the room, which is always makes me nervous when I talk about any uh, statistics, <laughs> because he is he probably has the most accurate statistics of any one of our industry, because they just, is not collected. Um, and he does a great job of collecting uh, things. So I'm, I'm fairly sure some of these stats are well out of date by now, but just to give you, I think really it's just to give a gist of where, of where production has come from and sparkling wines were uh, back when we started um, probably in the minority and now very much in the majority uh, and the quality, et cetera, around that has really enabled us to expand into international markets. Um, and also, uh, you know, I think, there's been, um, on the back of the success of the sparkling wines, I think still wines have also had a journey in that time as well and become, um, you know, more investment into that side of our industry as well. So overall, we're on a, you know, a, an exciting time. And as our dad used to say, you know, that the sort of the hockey stick curve of, um, uh, you know, of success, as it were, of our, of our industry, the growth in the industry um, is certainly well underway. Uh, although I think it just takes a bit longer time in a cool climate and with sparkling wine production because everything seems to take a long time and you have to have patience. So um, let us move on to the next slide. Uh, a little bit of an introduction about the family. Um, there's, so um, obviously a lot of you probably in the room may have met uh, our dad, Mike, um, who, who really is the brains behind uh, the establishment of, of Ridgeview. Um, and um, I think after that, Simon was the first to come along. Simon, how did you get involved in Ridgeview? So I got a phone call while I was finishing an engineering 
at college. And so I very begrudgingly said I'd come and help plant the vineyard with them um, as long as I could finish in the summer. And by the end of the summer, I realized I'd actually fall in love with farming and with grape growing. So I went back to college to study at Plumpton College, uh, which luckily for us is only about 10 minutes from here. So very handy. And originally just was going to look after the vineyards and then slowly moved into the winery to help dad uh, under our mentor, Kit Lindler, uh, which some of you may remember. And, um, and then moved full time into the winery in 98, 99. Um, and then moved, went to Australia to get some experience over there, which is um, where I met Mardi, uh, which some of you see on the screen here, who is now my wife and she joined us in, in 2000. So it's very much a family business and my brother-in-law, Lardy, when did he join us? Uh, well, I think he joined us under begrudgingly because he couldn't be bought, well, sitting around a family table <laughs> yeah. where he was the only one not working in the business it was actually getting a little bit tedious thing for him. So eventually we we managed to drag him in in probably about 2011 or 12. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, we are all we're all our skin is in the game, uh, as, it, as they say. And uh, um, that's been how we've been really now. Um, and, you know, the family, I suppose, was. At one point, the majority of our uh, of, of who worked at Ridgeview are now very much the minority. With, I think we've got probably about thirty five uh, to forty em employees, and that obviously gets uh, uh, increases seasonally at harvest and uh, at various times of the year. So, um, yeah, it's changed quite dramatically on that side of things. So we have an extended family nowadays. Our Ridgeview family. Our Ridgeview family. Um, and our children would obviously love to see that we're putting photos of them when they're <laughs> tiny on the uh, on the barrels on the right hand side. They, they love that. So. Let's... And then the third generation has yeah. now started. So Tam's eldest Owen worked for us last summer, helping out with bottling and in hospitality. And my eldest Jonah, he was helping out in the kitchen in the holidays as well. So next generation starting early. Yeah, keeping them engaged. <coughs> Um, and we, we're obviously well aware that um, the level of understanding of growing conditions and various other things is pretty high in this uh, in this room, as it were. So we won't go to dwell too much on it, but just to give perhaps people who aren't so familiar as to uh, the geology and uh, the reasons why the South, down, particularly around the South Downs and the Southeast of England has become sort of very focused <coughs> on um, English sparkling is just, it is, you know, at one point, uh, the you know England and France were joined, um, and the the, the chalk uh, seam that pops up in the south downs of England and uh, in the Reims and uh, Epinay area of France were at one point joined too. So geologically, there's a huge amount of similarities between particularly the southeast of England um, and that northern area of France. Uh, and also climatically, although we are an island, uh, it's a very narrow piece, particularly on the southeastern side that, that separates us from the continent. So we do get quite a lot of uh, shadow from the rain in terms of uh, the weather, weather coming into, into the UK. So the eastern side, or particularly the southeastern side, tends to get less of the rainfall when you look at average rainfalls. Uh, across thing and more of the sunshine hours. So hence why, it, you know, the Kent is the garden of England um, and a lot of the growing and uh, outside of just even agriculture takes place in the southeast and Sussex has become also kind of key area where we're based for, for viticulture. So um, it's no surprise, I think, that a lot of the, the growing for, for the industry is done in, in that area and in around those regions. Um, and um, just, I suppose, Simon, just to fill us in on the, what, the, what that means for viticulture in terms of the climate and the cool climate that we have. So I think um, it really helps as well. Growing season is slightly longer than it is in northern France. And I think for that, it really helps with the complexity and the fruit flavour profile with our wines, which is something I think, certainly at Ridgeview, we make a, the hero of the wine. And I think as an industry, so we've got, we are on that limit. So the acidity is... Um, acidity is there, it is quite high, but I think with the complexity that we can manage in the wine um, from that long growing season, I think marries it very well. We make a selling point of that. So it gives a, a freshness and a zip to it. Um, and also what's really interesting is that 
the southeast of England isn't a particularly large geographical area, but there are so many microclimates and different pockets of terroir that um, each area is almost its own appellation in a way. So they're bringing very interesting and different styles. But um, yeah, it's interesting. So this is a timeline, a bit of history of Ridgeview, um, as we said earlier, um, and Liz's introduction. So we planted in 1995. Um, it was mum and dad's sole intention that we would make sparkling wine um, using Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. And that'd be the only style of wine we felt as a family that if we were gonna do it, we would try and make one style of wine to the best of our ability. So we decided to stick at that time just to sparkling wine. Um, so when we originally started, it was a blank canvas. So Ridgeview was a big open field. Um, so at the time we didn't have the winery. So we had, we converted some existing stables for our first two vintages uh, while we built our winery, um, which we moved into in 99. At the time, I think we were the first wine, English commercial winery to have their own underground cellars, um, which was really important to us. So. Um, we don't need any temperature control. Obviously, there's, there's no power, there's no um, air conditioning or anything required. And even back then, we sat down as a family, we thought it's a challenge to grow grapes where we are. So being organic was something that we thought wasn't the right choice for us. But sustainability before it was really a buzzword that it is now was very key to us. So things like having underground cellars that didn't need temperature control, the type of sprayer that we invested in, which was... Um, I think we were the first in England to introduce it, which was a recycling sprayer. So we would use 60% less chemicals. So from the very beginning, that was always very key to us. Uh, so after moving into the winery, our first release of wine was in 2000. Gosh, I can't believe it's so long. <laughs> <laughs> um, to which we, um, amazingly, we entered the what was called then UK, United Kingdom's Vineyard Association, now which is Wine GB. Um, so with our first release, we amazingly won um, English Wine of the Year that I think shocked quite a few people, certainly us. But it's something we were very proud of and it was that was our intention that that's the quality of wine that we would make moving on. Um, then in 2005, so obviously it's amazing to win Wine of the Year on a domestic market and domestic competition. But we had started entering um, international wine competitions and in 2005, our Bloomsbury, which is our the largest and the one blend that we make every year, uh, won the International Wines and Spirits Competition's Best International Sparkling Wine. And that, um, that was a really key and amazing moment for us. It's something we were very proud of. Um, we used to have queues, didn't we, outside the winery, and we could only sell one bottle to anybody who turned yeah. up because we only had a very limited <laughs> amount of it. It was, it was quite funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, then in 2006, uh, it was the Queen's 80th birthday and obviously we were very honoured. Um, so she served our wine, our Blanc de Blanc uh, at the banquet, which was something, again, we were very, very proud of. And um, it's at this point, I think, it was starting to get a bit of more international recognition that we um, started to go out for export, which has been quite a key part of our business since then. Um, Scandinavia has been always been a really key market for us. In fact, our um, brand and our sales manager is actually in Norway as we speak at the um, Stavanka Food and Wine Festival, which is very pleased to be back after not being able to attend for two years. So that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. And then on that international journey, so winning the IWSC award was absolutely amazing. Um, but in 2010, Decanter, which as you know, is one of the most widely read wine journals in the world. At the time was the only, I think it was the only international competition that had champagne and sparkling wine in the same category. So a lot of the other wine competitions you have a champagne category and a sparkling wine. And in 2010, we won best sparkling wine international again with our Blanc de Blanc, this time it was in 2006. And that really was, obviously that was absolutely amazing for Ridgeview, but, um, I think it was a really key tipping moment for not just for Richard, but for our industry. So, you know, here we are in England in a very young and um, blossoming, I suppose, industry making international quality wines. And suddenly that trajectory took us international. And that week, well, over the next 10 days, I think we had 
film crews from all over the world. We had an interest coming all over the world. And not just for us, but for our industry, I think you can see our export really start to pick up after 2010. Um, to also say in 2011, another key moment for us was a uh, um, state banquet, uh, Barack Obama used our wine for the toast, which again was a really key thing for us, very proud of. Um, even more proud of as a family was in 2011 when our dad, uh, Mike Roberts, was an awarded an MBE for his services to the English wine industry. And that was, I think he was very proud of that. And we were very proud, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. So that was really key. And then 2012, um, our Bloomsbury 2009 was selected as the official wine for the Diamond Jubilee. I mean, that, so that was, again, was really exciting. Yeah, yeah. and I think it's, um, if we move on to the next slide, but the, one of the key things is, you know, before this, I can't remember a time when the Queen or all those sorts of state, you know, the state banquets and various other things would have ever served an English wine or if it would have been, been very rare. And I think since, probably 2006 onwards, almost all state banquets now at least have one of an English sparkling wine being served. And that's that's quite something really for the industry to be to be proud of. And just, I think, helps to, to show the quality uh, and the um, consistency of the wine and, and the faith now that's been put into it that perhaps wasn't there before. Um, so yeah, we um, I yeah I unfortunately have to start with a slightly slightly tinged with sadness in terms of the, the next um, part of the of our timeline, in which obviously our, our father passed away in 2014 rather suddenly and always too soon um, from all of us, but obviously gave uh, you know Simon and I being around um, you know we 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 knew what we had to do and to step up and to to keep you know his vision of Ridgeview going and, and the great thing with that as a family is that you've shared that for a long time and so we, we were I think helped helped us through a very difficult time knowing that we had that shared vision to, to try to get behind and work towards and um and and you know I, I think we've done a good job hopefully I, I think, think so. proud. <laughs> yeah. um and um and on top of that, um, you know, similar things with uh, being the official sparkling wine of Downing Street coming in 2016, more, you know, more banquets being uh, with our wines being served, which is a real honour. Um, but I think really, you know, one of my favourite moments, I think, in this timeline is 2018 and, and, and being awarded at the IWC the, the top, top award, which was the International Winemaker of the Year. And, and it was for wines, obviously, uh, it, it, they take into account your performance within the cap, you know, within their competition over a period of time. But the wine that won it was a wine that um, Simon made, you know, is his, probably one of his first wines without dad's input or one of those. And, and I think that for me was so important as well, um, just to, to for, for us as a next generation to see that we can continue that success ourselves without um you know um, perhaps you know moving away from from um you know that dad's not moving away from dad's influence but have being able to continue it ourselves and it was really really i felt extremely proud at that point um and it was dad's favorite competition because it was held at the guild hall and obviously the crypt tasting was his favorite part as it was and ours. And ours. um so um and then after this just moving forward um and i won't take too long over this bit but we, 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 you know, we, we have rebranded, which we'll come on to a little bit around the, some of the decisions around that. Um, and had we been able to, we would have celebrated with a big party, our 25th anniversary, uh, a new winery opening and various other things. But alas, we ended up spending all our time worrying about COVID uh, in 2020 and 2021. So we'll have to celebrate even more for our 30th, I think is, is where we'll go. So there's always another, another reason to, to celebrate. Um, do we all talk about this? Yep. So this is uh, obviously um, we grow uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier, um, same as they do in Champagne. Um, and I think that's really important for us. Obviously, there are you know Pinot Blanc is still allowed, and um, but it's, I think it's really key that we have those three classic varieties. And I think the awards that our Blanc de Blanc have won show that Chardonnay really is the, probably the most dominant of the three. Um, and the still wines from Chardonnay and Pinot Noir that are coming out now are, again, really proven to be stellar, really, really good quality. So, yeah. Um, and this is just a little bit, because there's various ways um, in terms of our growth 
uh, and, and how other our competitors have grown and the sort of the business decisions around that. Uh, we took, a, you know, early on to take an approach similar to, to that in Champagne and actually work with other growers. So to contract other growers to grow with us uh, as partners rather than to invest in the vineyards ourselves, And then we would focus our resources into the winemaking and the wine and that sort of expertise. Um, and that decision was taken uh, quite early on, 2004, 2005, when we decided as a family to grow the business. Um, and we have some very long-term partners um, dotted around and, and initially really mainly in Sussex, uh, but now over in sort of the recent our recent expansion, uh, we, we decided uh, due to mainly due to uh, try and mitigate some of the issues around well, not issues, but the, the climatic risk that we have uh, in terms of certain aspects, frost and, and wet and various other things at certain key times of our growing season. So we took the decision um, rather than just to focus on being all in Sussex that we would spread our growing into Kent, into Essex, into Suffolk and Suffolk and Essex being probably uh, not the more, the more well-known areas of growing in, in uh, the UK but certainly very dense you know becoming quite a significant part of, of where um, grapes are being grown in, in, the, in, in England so uh, that's how we've expanded the business from you know from our own site original site in Ditchling, which would have produced 30, 40, you know, 30,000 bottles at a, in a good year, really, uh, to where we are now, which is close to getting close to 300,000 bottles and with additional growth up to the half a million, hopefully by 2025. Well, just on that point, I was gonna, what's been really interesting is, um, obviously as Tam said, it, 2021 was quite a challenging harvest for some of our growers for weather-wise and having, um, Having growers all over southern England from that aspect was really good. Um, obviously, because certain areas had a better summer than others, so it meant that we we still had really good quality grapes. But what's really interesting is we're just going through blending the 2021 wines now, and um, so Bloomsbury, which we'll talk about later, is our biggest blend, and it's really nice. So in our winery, we have lots and lots of small tanks, so you can take you know we can keep every variety from every vineyard from every grower separate for. As, up until blending, blending the Bloomsbury process, uh, the process of blending the Bloomsbury is this year we've got um, 32 different components going into it. And it's amazing the difference between the Chardonnay bone north of the River Thames in Suffolk and Essex compared to one south of the river in North Kent to something in Hampshire or Berkshire. And they've all bring something different to the table. And it's just, it was really, really interesting this year more than some others, how the difference and what really nice elements from each region that they've brought. It's very interesting. Yeah, and probably on that, I wonder, you know, and I think that's a key thing at the moment, everything's being, you know, all the varietals, if we just even just took the three varieties are being planted everywhere. So we haven't even reached the stage in the industry where we've got particular regions, you know, being renowned for a certain varietal, which I think may eventually be where we end up with England, but uh, you know, perhaps Suffolk is, the place to grow, um, you know, and it might be a mixture of commercial in terms of yield and, you know, flavour profiles and various other things. But I think at the moment where everyone's doing a bit of everything, so it's quite, it's quite, I think there's still going to be some interesting changes um, in terms of how that works in the future. The F, the F word. word. So we talked about this earlier. We, um, Frost, we're lit, probably in the next few days, we're going to be entering what we call our fresh, Frost Watch period. Um, that's our real first biggest challenge, I think, of the growing season. Um, so to combat that, what we do is we have um, bougies, which are um, wax candles that we put out in the vineyard. This, as you see in the photo, that is our slice. And then the configuration we have, so we're over 15 acres, we put 600 of these out. Um, they're very expensive. Um, so we try and keep, make them last as many nights as possible. So our vineyard team go out meticulously every 15 minutes, half an hour, they check in the thermometers. So they light them at the last minute. Um, it takes them about an hour to light them. Um, so we light them when they get, when we know it's, if it's going to get below zero, we'll light them probably about one or two in the morning. Um, and then um, put them out when the sun's up. So we'd normally get about three frosts worth of candles out of them. Um, 
was they're 600 and I think they're nine euros each. So it's quite an expensive um, protection, but not to do anything would be completely wrong. And we're trialing in the middle of the Chardonnay vineyard, which this is a photo of. We have um, six, five rows, which we have um, an electrical wire running along the fruiting, fruiting zone, which is on the thermostat. So that will come on if we're getting below one degrees. And that generates enough heat um, to stop to stop them um, getting any frost damage. So that's proving very interesting. Um, obviously it's, an, it's a cost layout to roll that out further, but that's proving very good. And then uh, quite a few of our other growers use what's called a frost drain, which is um, basically, it's just a huge funnel that you put at the lowest point of the vineyard with a big fan at the bottom of it. And that draws down the cold air, shoots that up into the atmosphere to warm up and as it drops back down as warm air. Um, again, that proves very, um, very effective as long as you remember to turn the thermostat on yeah which one of our guys helpful. forgot to do one year yeah. and, uh, and i think it'd be fair to say not every site has the same uh, risk of frost as, as um the others so it really depends on where that site is the selection of that site and what's around it so we have another vineyard now um which is probably 10 15 miles away from no, not even that, sorry, five miles away from Vint from where we are now, which probably will not require any frost protection just because of the way the site is and, and where the, um, the ability for the frost just to roll completely off and down into uh, an area of water and things like that. So, you know, the risk is a very site specific risk. Um, and certainly some sites are, you know, are, are worse off than others, aren't they? Uh, or can, can cope with it better than others. So our winemaking style. So we've always um, we've always tried to take a relatively minimal minimalistic approach. Um, we really our wines. We want the the grapes to speak for themselves. So as little intervention as we can do, um, we will. That's not to say that we don't. So we, you know we do add sulfur, we do add enzymes, but we want the wines to be um, as pure as they can be. Um, attention to detail is the most important thing for us, and I think. Despite we have a small team in the winery, everyone has that shared passion that we want to make the best wine we can. And I think um, hopefully the consistency of the quality that we make is what really shines through. And whether it's our um, non-vintage wines or our limited vintage wines, the one thing that is consistent, I think hopefully people see with our wines is that the fruit, fruit profile at the beginning of the wine and on the palate is always the hero. And everything we do in the winery is to maintain that. And, that's what we work towards and that's what we hopefully mm. we do. Yeah, I think that would be a fair, fair comment on the house style that we're producing. Um, let's move on. Yeah, so I was just going to quickly, there's, um, um, you know, I'm not, obviously you all know the different um, methods of sparkling wine um, and how they're made. Now, in England, um, we, we've been traditional methods, sparkling wine producers, uh, that's where we started. Um, and like any new industry or any new um, growing, exciting growth industry, uh, there are now we're starting to see um, some experimentation, some um, different styles of sparkling wines being made. Uh, perhaps the most, you know, in terms of, com you know, competing with ours would be uh, the sort of the tank method, the Charmette method sparkling wines are starting to come into uh onto the market and not in a huge way but it, it you know in a growing way and for, with some i think certain new uh, entrants into the industry being very very focused on that particular area of winemaking which in itself um is not a bad thing you know uh, we all like to to see you know there be some innovation um and we as a country uh, and as an industry are not sort of uh, I suppose, strapped to particular appellations or rules. We know we are very, um, we have very few rules in terms of winemaking that, that we need to follow. Um, and we choose to follow quite a few in, in the winery in terms of pressing and various other things. We would probably choose to follow the CIBC pressing rules, but yeah. that's not actually a, a requirement that we need to do. Um, so um, with that in mind, th there's been quite a bit of, uh, I would say, potential conflict in our industry around different methods and how, and we don't have a name. So English sparkling wine um, really basically means anything that's English and sparkling can fit into that category. 
Um, so now we're in a situation where all the, the sort of the, the established traditional methods, sparkling wine producers, and perhaps some of those new entrants into that area who invest in lots of money are now thinking, hang on a minute, does that mean somebody making a charm of wine will then, you know, be be taking, you know, on, you know, starting to um, I suppose scratch, you know, scratch away at the quality elements of, of what classic method of what the traditional method is. Um, so there was a, a feeling that uh, we needed to differentiate those somehow. And one of the ways in which, and, and if I'm honest, trying to get our industry, however many saw 695 vineyards to agree on a name for the wine was was an impossible, um, you know, task. Uh, and we could have probably spent the next decade, 20 years, just, just agreeing on that. So the, a way around that was to actually think of, well, how should we, should we just classify the methods slightly different and allow a, sort of a trademark or a, an element of um, uh, sort of differentiation between those two methods? I mean, obviously labeling is really important um, and we'll sort of certainly go down that route that the method of perhaps on the Charmant method, should state Charmant method, but we also understand that consumers may not be looking quite as closely at labels as we think they do. So we were looking at ways in which to uh, differentiate those two classes. And the classic method is, uh, has sort of been brought forward with a mark and various other things. And it's very early stages of this for the industry. A lot of education needs to go, particularly through the trade and various other things, just to start to, and also to get the buy-in from some of the larger producers to start to utilize uh, this, this mark, as it were, or this, uh, we'll talk about this method as being the tradition to, to signify it's a traditional method sparkling wine uh, grown in England. So that's a little there. If you hear that being spoken about in English sparkling wines, that is what it's to, to trying to, to achieve. Um, very early stages. I don't think it's quite got to where it needs to be yet. Um, um, but, you know, it, I think there are moves to, to, to be a little bit more. I would say rigid around some of those areas in terms of the, you know, to, to, to make the traditional methods, sparkling wines of England, the sort of the, the halo of what we do uh, and to build those up. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's an interesting um, arguments going on at the moment in the industry regarding that. Discussions. <laughs> Same thing. Uh, <laughs> and this, yeah, just to, um, we recently, um, did a rebrand re of the wines uh, back in 2018. Marty will be either nodding or shaking her head. I can't. I think it was definitely 2018. Um, and I think one of the one of the um, the nice, or I suppose one thing I really wanted to mention about that is that because we're, you know, I think we spent a lot of our time in the early years pretending not to be English. Um, because to get an objective tasting of your wines was actually very, very tricky in the early stages. Uh, English wines didn't have a great reputation. Um, so bringing this out, you, you know, you could tell people had tasted it before if they'd even, it even touched their, their lips. They, they had made a, a, an assumption about the wine. Um, and so quite for quite a while, um, we spent a lot of time trying to make it not look like an English wine and perhaps follow more of the cues of a, a traditional spark, you know, French sparkling. Um, uh, at one point, I don't think we even had English on 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 the label. Um, so, what we've sort of what what we felt actually is we could break away from that. We've become, you know, the category um, has become so uh, well respected, well regarded um, as a category on its own. And England is now a really important part of our sales and the selling part of the wine. Um, and people are seeking it out, whole, you know, even in the trade and consumers. So it's been a complete change from when we started uh, 26, 20, you know, 26 years ago to where we are today in terms of being able to sell and promote English sparkling wine. So we just felt we could break away a little bit from those uh, traditional cues on the labeling and, and have a little bit more of a bit more fun, still have the quality elements of it, but um, the, the new labels, which is obviously the, the, the lower uh, six one, the white labels and the black labels was, was where we ended up with that, you know, the, highlighting some of the colors and, and just having a bit more, bit more fun with the labels rather than being feeling too restricted by, um, where, by, by sort of those old cues. And also um, like having life is for celebrating uh, coming into the foils and things like that, which is uh, this strap line of uh, actually mum and dad, you know, that was their strap line for, for, the, for the business for a long, long time. And it's just nice to bring all of those elements up into, into the packaging as well. 
So these are our wines. So we have three um, non-vintage wines. Um, the Bloomsbury, which we've talked about earlier, is this is the one wine that we have made every single year. Um, and this tends, this is always Chardonnay dominant. It's roughly about 60% um, 60 Chardonnay, 25% Pinot Noir, a little bit of Pinot Meunier. And the reason that was the cepage for the Bloomsbury is because that's what we grew here in the first year. And it's, it represents, we think, or Dad and I thought, that it reflected very much what England does best. The so Chardonnay is our most dominant, um, followed by Pinot Noir, but you need the Mernier to bind that all together. And um, we thought it tasted, you know, of English hedgerows, um, apples, um, slight tropical hints to it. And it was what we felt an English sparkling wine blend should be. And this has actually become, become quite a classic traditional English blend. So when you taste the English sparkling wine, the surpass generally tends to be that it will be Chardonnay dominant followed by Pinot Noir. Um, Cavendish is much more of a classic blend, so that's a third of each. And I really like to show these two wines side by side because it is the same surpass, just the opposite way around. And the difference between the two is always amazes customers. So the Bluesby is very much made in the style of an aperitif. What I like about the Cavendish is it's a very, quite a foody um, sparkling wine. I think it lends itself very well, especially to Asian food, because it's quite soft and round and it's got the acidity, but it's also got that fruity freshness. So it all marries itself very well to that sort of hot and um, sweet and sour style of Asian food. And I think this is a really good match. And it got us thinking, um, so we've now started a lot of our key restaurant partners to do a lot of winemakers dinner. We do all five courses, or all six courses, all with sparkling wine. And what I love about that is um, just not only introducing people to English sparkling wine, quite often they've never had it before, but also for um, matching five courses, all with sparkling wine, which I think is really interesting. Um, and then onto Fitzraven, which is our non-vintage rosé, which is actually a very similar cepage to the Bluesbury, um, but we add a uh, red Pinot Noir wine for the colour. And again, it's very light and fresh. Then you come on to our limited releases. So these are very much limited. So the Bloomsbury, for example, is 150, 140,000 bottle blend. These are all very limited. So they're all restricted to 5,000 bottles. And we only make them in the very, in the years that they really do warrant it. So for example, the 2021, we're only making a Blanc de Blanc. We're not making a Blanc de Noir or a Rose de Noir. Um, the Rose de Noir is quite an interesting, so for us, that's our interpretation of a Sagne Rosé. So very different to the Fitzroy. This is much richer, much more complex, um, and obviously three years old as opposed to 18 months to two years old. So there are um, six wines. Yeah, and the Blanc yeah. de Blanc um, comes, the Chardonnay for the Blanc de Blanc only comes from our first planted vineyard in Ditchling. So that all automatically limits it there as well. Yeah, so that's so, our only single estate. Yeah. So obviously we we always struggled it seems to keep up with production, um, but we are or I am allowed every now and then <laughs> to uh, experiment and have a play. So this was our latest release, which, um, as it looks on the label, is a very heavily influ oak influenced wine. Um, this was made over multi vintages, so it's three vintages aged in new oak, three year old Burgundy oak, and ten year old Loire oak. Um, and it's um, it's still keeping in with the Ridgeview style and the Ridgeview house, but it is quite a step away. Um, I made it because I like it. So you much. should. Yeah. So you should. No, even I like. I'm not a massive oak fan, and even I like it. So you did a good job. Well done. Perfect with Christmas lunch. Yeah. Um, we've spoken a little about about the accolades. So I won't go back through those. We've talked about the export market. I mean, this is just a, a sort of an idea of the types of um, uh, accounts that are picking up English sparkling. This is, these are some of our accounts, both past and present, I have to say, because the slides are hard to keep up to date, but um, we work through the uh, on trade. And these are a few of the names that we work with um, from restaurants, hotel chains, um, you know, Michelin stars to more sort of gastro 
side of things. Um, and also uh, we have some really strong off-trade partners, some of whom were very early adopters to us, Waitrose, we've been supplying since 2003, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Lathwaite's even precede that. So, um, you know, these they've been some long term partners uh, and early adopters of English sparklings, and, and probably Waitrose being uh, the champion now of, of all English wines. Uh, they started very early on that journey um, and a bit, made a big difference to the industry as well. And without those sort that sort of those in partners and investment into into the category, um, we probably you know it, it probably would have been a much tougher journey than it than it is uh, than it has been. It was tough enough, if I'm honest, but uh, having people like that helping you has been been absolutely super important. Um, we spoke a little bit about the, the, the great British classic method, and um, that's the, the hallmark that, that you can see on the left hand side of the screen. I'm just going to talk a little bit about B Corp, um, and Simon will talk about the sustainable wines because uh, he's much more involved a little bit in the committees on that. But we took a decision, and it's something that I've been thinking about for quite a while, but the one, one of the good parts of being uh, having some time over COVID was to actually start to think a little bit more about um, you know these sorts of types of things and the, the the for me the sustainable not just sustainability but the uh treatment of people in your workplace uh that it's a bigger picture than that and it's not it's it's you know environmental sustainability is is, is extremely important um, and has become much higher up the agenda and it should have been much higher up the agenda a long time ago but now it very much is i think on the top of most agendas um, but for Richview, that's been on the agenda for quite a long time, but as so has um, the treatment of our people, looking after our place. Uh, and we've never been, um, it's been more about balancing all of those elements for Richview for a very long time. So when, B Corp, when I heard about B Corp, which is um, People Place Profits, it's a, an accreditation that, that, that you can get provided you get you, you you have to reach some pretty high standards across all of those elements um, and we're currently just in the verification queue we, we submitted last year um, and and it's really really important uh, for me personally I think for the family personally to get that accreditation because it kind of reflects our ethics in the business as well um, so it's been I've been really I've been really excited to go on that journey because it was just tick so many of the boxes uh, but also then gives you to say look we this is what we do this is how we operate and have something to prove or show for, for all of that work that you do behind the scenes to, to, to make the place a great place to work. Um, so that's that's hopefully, I'm hoping by the end of the year, but there's big delays on that to, to, to be able to have some good news on that. But also alongside that sustainable wine scheme. So this is a scheme that's now in its uh, second year. We started, this was really the, um, the brainchild and baby of Chris Foss which I'm sure some of you will know, was a, used to be a lecturer at Plumpton Wine College. And he and Alastair Nesbitt uh, really started thinking about this about 15 years ago. And I think retirement really gave Chris the time to make it a real focus. So this is now uh, a national scheme for sustainable wines of Great Britain, um, which we set up, um, as it says on the tin really, that to, to grow grapes and make wine in as sustainable way as possible. So it's very much in its infancy that at the moment we create a best practice, which the following year the guidebook is updated and best practice becomes minimum standard. So it's a very evolving, um, very evolving scheme. I'm very proud to be part of it. It's had very good pickup in the first two years. Um, as we go into the third year and then the first re-audit of the new members will open that up. So at the moment it's limited so that we can just concentrate on getting all the scheme working properly I guess um, but the hope is certainly for Ridgeview is that all our growers will be part of the scheme and I think talking to some of our national distributors um, they'll probably make it a requirement if you want to supply this, them that you'll need to be part of this scheme but as I say it's very in its early stages. Um, and the next sort of development for Ridgeview I'll just quickly go through is, is that we're now you know it's all very well. Um, we, we're making great wines and everything else. The next thing I think for the industry is tourism and to, to maximise though that element of it. And this is 
our plans for our site in Ditchling, which is uh, an alfresco. It, they are enclosed as well, these pods, but about 120 seat um, dining area with a kitchen and various other bits there. So, you know, I think there's a lot of investment in the industry now to start to, to really tap into the, the local tourism and, and international wine tourism. Um, and to show off everything that we're doing, the beautiful countryside that we that we that we have, um, and the beautiful wines that we create from it. So, I think again, that's another sort of stage in the process of the industry growing up. And I think it's quite exciting that it's not just Ridgeview; it's a lot of places now looking to to add these uh, you know visitor attractions onto the site, taking it really seriously. Um, so, yeah, very exciting times ahead, and hopefully this will be open in August. Um, we're building as we speak, so. Fingers crossed. I think it also just shows how our industry is just, it's just another evolution in how we're growing up and, mm. it, you know, competing with our international colleagues. Yeah, absolutely, now. yeah, absolutely. Be a destination. And there we are. We're going to leave you with our life is for celebrating. Um, and thank you very, very much for listening to us. Yes, thank and you I'll very much. Close this down so we can actually see you all. Okay, let me just move these things around so I can see you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I think, uh, yeah, what a, what a wonderful story and great to listen to it. It was really fascinating. Thank you both very much. Uh, Stephen has been doing a grand job for you while you've been talking, answering a lot of the questions. <laughs> <you're asking laughs> me. So I think thank we you, Stephen. Probably move on to um, please anybody put anything after the conversations with um, Stephen there if there's or any other mentions if there's anything else that uh, any other questions that you have for Tamara or Simon please is there anybody I have a question if you want oh, hi Tamara hi Simon hi, hi. hi. Everybody. Um, it strikes me that yields are still a little worryingly low from an economic point of view. Is there any sign that they're increasing with improved knowledge of uh, sites and viticulture? Yeah, I think that's that's a really interesting question. I think um, I think the biggest reason for the increase in yields, I think, is as an industry, we just increased knowledge and um, how to prune, how to look after them, but in site selection, um, you know, people aren't just saying, "Oh, I have a field that faces south, I'm going to plant it." There's a lot more research. So you are seeing um, a slight increase in yield. But for us, um, that comes with a caveat that quality is still paramount. Um, so we would rather our growers grow for quality than quantity. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I think there is, and you know, there are, you know, our planting densities and various other things are slightly different. It's quite hard to um, you know, look at yields per acre per hectare when there's quite a lot of differences around that, but they're certainly lower than they they need, you know, they they could be, I think. Um, I think just with with a, a and we, I we also know from our own growing sectors, you've got those who concentrate more on it than others. And actually, those it, it, you know, you concentrate more on your growing and, and focus on it, you will get better yield consistently year on year uh, from the site. And we've seen that through you know sites, particular sites where they've not been looked after particularly well initially, but have then had the attention they deserve. And all of a sudden, yeah, your yields are much more consistent and predictable, even in, in difficult years. So, yeah, I think I think there is definitely, um, you know, been a, the, you can't, you know, and, 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 you know, one of the biggest issues you have is people thinking, oh, just, I've got a feel, I want to grow some grapes. And, you know, you spend most of your time just saying, please don't do it. Um, you, you know, it's it's not, unless you're, you know, you're, you're committed to that part of it, um, then you will fail. It's not easy to grow. Thank you. Question. Thank you. Is there anything else anybody would like to ask? Oh, no, yes, okay. I'd love to. Okay. I'd, no. I'd, I'd like to ask, um, are there signs of any other producers of sparkling wines elsewhere okay. in the world coming to England to try to um, take advantage of the newfound success of English sparkling wines. Yeah, um, yeah Fresh and A for Bolney. So yes, yeah. that's one uh, big thing. So yes, yes, definitely. And um, there have been plenty of other. Uh, the Champagne were, was, were, were definitely interested for a while. I think that's... We've got Tattinger. I've got the own Vineyard in Kent. Yeah, Tattinger in uh, Kent. Pomerol, um, have 
are growing their own grapes. Yeah, so there's already investment in. I, I think there's a lot more um, of sort of the, the big sort of the bigger international wine companies looking over here because it's a growth industry. It's exciting. It's um, uh, so yeah, I, yeah, definitely. I think it's. I, I think there's a. I think there are a few. I, th I think there's more of that. Can I say something on yes, that? Yes, Stephen. Sorry. Yeah, I, I get quite a lot of interest. I mean, all the others that do as well, I think. The one thing that, of course, when they see such things as the yields we get, or the sugar levels, the acid levels, and the whole sort of, you know, dynamic of it, it puts a lot of them off. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a really big problem, I think, uh, with, with, for the ongoing expansion of the industry, really, because it can't, it can't carry on being an unprofitable, you know, three quarters of vineyards do not have yields that, that repay the investment. For some people, that's not important. I understand that, but you know, so we can do it, but only in the right places with the right density you mentioned and the right sites. Yeah, that will slowly change. And as more and more, you know, the question was the question about how many grapes are sold each year. I reckon it's about 25 30 percent of the whole crop is actually traded. Um, and and that's the reason now there's more vineyards in Essex and in southeast England is because people need if you're selling grapes you've got no upside at all from the wine sales and so you know if you've only got two tons to the acre you can probably get by you know five ton per hectare if you're selling it all direct but if you're selling grapes at that yield no way mm -hmm. you can't just it, it doesn't work so that's why the southeast is now becoming much more dominant because you've got people planting d dozens of acres you know tw 10 15 hectares or plus to, to get to get economies of scale. Um, can I ask, um, do you have control over the vineyards that you buy from, from the, from the growers? Do you, do you actually um, prune, get them pruned the way you want and, and so on? Um, not that we don't dictate to them how they should prune or, but we do work very closely with them. Our vineyard manager is in constant contact with them. Um, we call them our partners because that's how we work together. It's before we even decide that we're going to buy grapes from people, we make sure that we have a good working relationship with them so that we're both on the same page about what we expect from the growers, what we want them to do for us. Um, and then we're very much, it's a joint decision on the sort of season that they have, when they pick, how they pick, when they pick. So. We don't we don't tell them what they're to do, but we're the very much. I suppose, yeah. Most, but most of the growers that we've worked with have probably come into the industry after us and are new. So we spend when they're setting up, we're probably there with them from the very beginning, and so they are learning what they what they do from us to an mm. extent as well. Yeah. So that there, <clears throat> there aren't there's not many vineyard. I don't think there's any of our growers who haven't been sort of starting up um, with us. So we haven't sort of taken, you know, there isn't an awful lot of swapping around of growers particularly. There's one, we've probably got one or two now who are more established growers mm -hmm. who we've just started working with. But the majority of them, we, we, we started with, they've started with us. So although we're not telling them what to do, they're, they're learning from us. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I might just say that one of our top classic producers makes um, bubbly in England now at Hambledon, Peter Ferreira, I'm sure some of you know. Of oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but that's that's just him. But I mean, he makes it also in California. So you know, he's mm. he's getting quite a lot of experience around the world of making bubbly. Mm. I have Thank a you, question, Meg. if I may. Um, mm. Meg Maker, I'm in the U.S. and I'm interested in your exports. Are you kind of breeze by the slide? But I'm interested in how much goes to the U.S. and if you find that the price point is such that uh, that sometimes is a, a hurdle for people? Um, so the answer is we, we, we ship a small amount to the US. It's our biggest export market, but the export for us is relatively, you know, it's about 15%. So of that 15%, probably half would go to the US. If, if we think pre-COVID, because COVID's had a massive impact on all of that, so that would be unfair to say now. Um, I think price points always an issue wherever you go. Um, you know, you know, in terms of where we have success is, is places like uh, the Scandinavia, you know, where they have oh, yeah. the monopolies and those sorts of things where quality is is king. Uh, the US 
I suppose we started back in 2011 in the US, so it has been a slow burn. Mm -hmm. um, and other, you know, there are, it's kind of a, it's, I think it's still a, a big target for English wines, the US, and most uh, producers who are exporting the US is very, very much high on their, on the, you pro and probably has the most producers represented in that export market but even so we're just a tiny tiny weeny drop in the ocean of wine over there um so yes it is but i think it as well it's uh, an educational element for the u.s market as well about as to, as to why that price point is where it is it's not yeah. uh, you know there, it would be you know you get to a point where if we can't sell it for any less than that otherwise we would go broke so you know it's kind of um so that, that it, it's not a case exactly. of you know that it's being um priced at a point that's not uh, that's just you know it, it does come down to as we've spoken about numerous time yield which is the biggest mm -hmm. killer of you know or in cost to to the industry um and just you know we're, we're 50 percent probably less uh, of, of the yields that a champagne would easily produce mm -hmm. In, in a in a year so you know factor that in you know you kind of think we're actually quite good value if i'm honest yeah but, um yeah. um so you know so it's, it's that educational piece which is tricky and and, and also yeah. visibility um you know mm -hmm. it, there probably isn't an awful lot around either uh in, in the us no. uh, to see no, there isn't yeah thank you very much that's helpful no are there any other questions for simon or tamara now, lots of people have been saying their thanks to you both for a wonderful yeah. presentation. Um, inspiring, was one person said there. So it's gone down very well. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I don't know if Liz, the hand over to Liz, if there's nobody else with any questions. Okay, well, a very big thank you to you both. Um, I think it's been a real education for people who already know about English sparkling wine. And hopefully, um, more of an introduction for people who are less familiar and great with an international audience like this that um, we're really spreading the word about how English sparkling wine, um, the quality, the commitment and the fact that everybody ought to drink it to celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. Nice much. to see everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful. Thank you for your time.